So this is Pico de Gallo, and this is the Pico Gus. What's the difference between Pico de Gallo and the Pico Gus? Well, one is a Mexican condiment that is delicious with chips, and the Pico Gus has chips, right? Moving on. So as you can see, this is an isocard. It's red, and it does Gravis ultrasound things. Now you might assume that hey, it's probably very similar to the reproductions of the Gus that I showed previously on this channel, like the ones from David's Electronics. And you couldn't be more wrong, really, to be honest with you. See, this little guy can do so much more than your average reproduction sound card, and it's ultimately unique amongst the sea of different reproductions and other things that people have made. So let's take a look at this thing in a little bit more detail, listen to some samples, and have some fun configuring it with our system. So let's go. So how is the Pico Gus different from normal reproductions like the Argus or Orpheus? Well, instead of sourcing original chips, which can often be hard to find or expensive, the Pico Gus relies on emulation. As you might have guessed from the name, sitting at the heart of the Pico Gus is the RP2040 microcontroller or it is more widely known as the Raspberry Pi Pico. This little chip pretty much does everything that the card offers in terms of features and allows the Pico Gus to be far more flexible than a real retro card could ever dream to be. The Pico Gus's best party trick is the fact that it can emulate far more than just the Gus, and since emulation is done with software, the card can be flashed and upgraded as the project evolves over time. As of right now, the project has firmware for the Gravis Ultrasound, AdLib, MPU-401, Tandy 3 Voice, and Game Blaster. Oddly enough, as I was making this video, the Sound Blaster emulation was released as well. There are also a few other things that stand out just by looking at the card itself. Along with the expected 3.5mm audio output, you also get a wavetable header, a USB-A port for joystick emulation, and another 3.5mm output that can be used with the included adapter for MIDI. This is the 2.0 version of the card, and Ian Scott, the creator of the project, sells them on Tindy for $45. The project is fully open source as well, so if you're the tinkering type, you can also build your own. Just be aware that you might want to use the 1.1 design since it's a bit more DIY friendly than this 2.0 version. Now in the past, I've seen people get salty about the cost of reproduction cards and assume that many creators of these projects are simply exploiting the community. I really don't think that is the case here, and in my opinion, $45 is an extremely fair price for this. If you were to consider the cost of active development, testing, materials, and just the amount of personal time spent, I don't really think it adds up to him making a ton of money or a big giant profit off of this project. Really, I find the biggest problem with the price is the fact that they sell out very quickly. So if you really want one, I would recommend signing up for the waitlist on Tindy and then pouncing quickly when the stock notification email arrives. I should note that that's how I got this card as well. This is not a sponsored review of any sort. I just bought it because I think it's neat. But anyway, enough about that stuff, let's get this card in a system and test it out. So per usual, I'm using my Slot 1 Celeron rig, and I'll be testing all the different modes and cool things this little red beast can do. Compared to a real Gus configuration, it's a walk in the park, I'll tell you that much. To get everything going properly, there's really only a few things that you need to do. First, you need to download the Gus software with all the patches, and extract everything into the root of your drive in the Ultra SND folder. Then you just have to set up your auto exec to correspond to the proper jumper settings you have set on the PCB along with the Ultra SND directory. Lastly, much like a real Gravis ultrasound, you need a British piece of software to initialize the card. Now on a real Gus, you would run around the Ultra Net EXE which actually does work on the Pico Gus in Gus mode, but for all intents and purposes, the PGUS in it, EXE is what you want to use. After this initialization program is run, it should be detected and usable for any supported games or software, and 
that's pretty much all you need to do to get it working. Now this version of the card will ship with the GUS firmware preloaded, but as I said before, you have the capability to load different firmware to emulate other sound devices, and flashing the card with new firmware is easy. All you need to do is place the firmware files in the root directory where you have the PGUS initialization program, and then you can quickly load new firmware by using the forward slash F command switch and typing in the name of the firmware you want to load. After you reload the PGUS init again, it will initialize the card as the new firmware. The best part about this is after the new firmware is loaded, you don't even have to restart the PC to utilize the new card settings. You can just reconfigure your program and it's basically just like virtually switching out cards on the fly. We don't really think about the fact that you can do this on emulation programs like DOSBox, but doing it on real hardware is still kind of mind-boggling to me. It's so freaking cool. Now, if the thought of flashing firmware all the time sounds scary, it's not really an issue since the card can easily be restored if it gets bricked. If you hold down the boot cell button on the PicoGus and plug it into a PC, it will show up as a removable drive and then you can drag and drop firmware on the card to restore or update it. It should go without saying that this card is designed for DOS programs. However, you can still use the PGUS init to play DOS games under Windows 95 or 98 if you wish. Just keep in mind you will probably want another sound card installed to handle Windows stuff. Okay, so now it's time to address the elephant in the room. Emulation. Purists will always scoff at the idea of emulation, or that it will never equate to the real thing, and I guess that is valid somewhat. The PicoGus will not provide perfect emulation or sound in every application or game, and since we're dealing with a wide range of hardware, it's not even guaranteed to work on every PC. Now for the most part, I had a pretty good experience with this card and almost everything I threw at it ran, except for Descent in Gus mode for some reason, just kind of would lock up every time I loaded it. I could test the sound and music in the setup program, but when I went to launch the actual game, it didn't work for some reason. Now they do have a compatibility list for software and hardware, and Descent is listed as compatible, so it's probably just a me issue, but you should maybe check out that list to see if your hardware is compatible and see if it'll run the games or programs that you want to run. But honestly, these are pretty minor, piddly issues in my opinion. And the focus of this card is Gravis Ultrasound Emulation, and it's top tier in that regard. I think you would struggle to tell the difference between this and a real Gus, and for 45 bucks, that's incredible. Now, the Sound Blaster OPL emulation is a bit more wonky, and I can tell some things are off in some games. However, it's still perfectly serviceable, and far better than most any bargain bin 90s sound card. Even with its flaws, the cool part is all of this is subject to change. This project is updated fairly frequently, and you could only be a download away from a better experience. So I saved the best for last here. Let's hear what it sounds like. I recorded all these samples directly from the audio output of the PicoGus. So I'll thank my awesome YouTube members, and I'll leave the video off here for you to enjoy the sounds of the PicoGus.
Bye. Bye.